Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Camila Curi, and I'm a Public Programs Fellow here at the Brooklyn Museum. I am very honored to be introducing tonight's program. As a woman and a Latina myself, I feel very empowered by um, the presence and the voices of the women with us tonight. Iris Morales, Rosa Clemente, Victoria Barrett, and our moderator, the Brooklyn Museum's very own Director of Education, Adra Jones Jomeza. And yes. <laughs> in a time when hundreds of women are still being unjustly punished for raising their voices against the injustices facing their communities and the world at large, it feels very pertinent for us to be joining in tonight's conversation. Um, I want to acknowledge the life of a woman in particular, um, Marielle Franco, who was murdered in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil on March 14th, 2018. She was a politician, she was a human rights activist, and all around an incredible woman. And I just want to say that Marielle, estamos todos presentes. Um, this conversation tonight is presented alongside the new exhibition, Radical Women in Latin American Art, 1960 to 1985. If you haven't seen the show yet, please do not miss it. The museum's open until 10 p.m. tonight, so you get a chance to take a peek but it's an extensive show, so make sure you come back and take your time to look at the incredible work by all of these Latin American women. Um, tonight, um, welcoming to the stage and introducing the speakers are at the Brooklyn Museum's very own Alma and Evians from the team staff. <laughs> Woo! So without any further ado, I wanna welcome to the stage to get the show going, so please. Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Alma Rodriguez. I am a team council member here at the Brooklyn Museum. Tonight, I have the honor to introduce to you Rosa Clemente. Rosa Clemente is a doctoral student in the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of UMass Amherst and an organizer, political commentator, an independent journalist, and a freedom fighter who has spent her life dedicated to scholar activism. Rosa has fought her way to provide support for the Black and Latinx community through the founding of Know Thyself Productions and the first ever National Hip Hop Political Convention. She's even run for vice president. I admire Rosa Clemente for all the incredible work she has done to help and promote representation to communities that are often underrepresented her hard work inspires a lot of people, just like me, to keep on advocating for what is right and well-deserved. Please welcome Rosa Clemente. Next, I would also like to introduce to you Victoria Barrett. Victoria Barrett is an Afro-Indigenous Garifuna Honduran climate change and human rights activist. Current, <laughs> a current student at University of Wisconsin, Madison, attending with a full tuition scholarship, and a Brooklyn Museum teen alumni. <laughs> she has been an active member at the Alliance for Climate Education Action Fellowship and is a plaintiff in the current Alternatives Trust lawsuit against the federal government for the role in failing to protect the rights of young people in an environment threatened by climate change and uncertainty. From traveling to Paris for the COP21 UN Conference, on climate change and speaking at the United Nations headquarters in New York City, I am, com I am completely inspired by Victoria Barrett. Since I first met her here at the museum, she has exhibited a deep passion for environmental activism and has accomplished so much at such a young age. She is brilliant and cares deeply about climate change, justice and human rights and is advocating for better changes for the protection and improvement on our environment. Please welcome one of my good friends, Victoria Barrett. <laughs> Hello. My name is Avian Darrow. Um, I'm a senior in the Museum of, uh, Apprentice Program. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, next, we are going to welcome Ms. Um, Iris Morales. <laughs> um, this amazing woman has dedicated her time and energy to the advancement of the Puerto Rican community, women's rights, wo workers' rights, and social justice. Organizing in East Harlem, she was the first woman to join the Radical Young Lords Party and became a lead. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> and became a leading member. Edith Morales took action and always fought to better her community. Furthermore, Ms. Morales got her law degree from NYU and she worked as a drug rehab educator, created youth media organizations, and worked to challenge stereotypical media portrayals of Latinx communities. I feel personally connected with Edith Morales because I too strongly believe in helping people around me the best way possible. Sometimes it takes, it takes one person to inspire many. So ladies and gentlemen, here is Edith Morales. Um, last but not least, I will be welcoming Adjua Jones de Almeria. <laughs> if you don't know her, get to know her. Graduating from Brown University, she received a Fulbright scholarship to research community schools and cultural identity in Bahia, Brazil. Moving to Brooklyn in 96, she worked as a high school teacher and helped to create Sister to Sister, a women's collective dedicated to the personal and community power of young women of color. She earned her master's degree from Columbia in international education and, hold on, <laughs> educational development. She co-founded a community-based organization, Diaspora Solidaria, in Brazil. In 2013, she began her work at the Brooklyn Museum as museum educator and now the director of education. Anytime, anytime I see Adjua, she has a big smile and gives us, su and gives us such a warm, welcoming energy. Hearing about her strong foundation and academics to help the youth inspires me to one day inspire others just like that. Now please put your hands together for Adjua. So hi everyone, welcome. I am so honored, so truly, truly honored to be here with the three of you and to have this opportunity to have um, a conversation, a public conversation with the three of you and hopefully with all of you as well. Um, the four of us sitting here, one of the things that I've just been reflecting on as I've been preparing for this conversation is um, how you know we represent so many interesting, different perspectives. We represent multiple generations, um, different cultural traditions, uh, perspectives, approaches to both organizing and to even maybe the idea of art. Um, so I'm excited to bring all of this wisdom, all of these interesting intersections and perspectives into this conversation. Our point of departure for this conversation is the exhibit that, that was just mentioned in, in the introduction, which is the exhibition upstairs right now. If you haven't checked it out, please do. You might have to come back because it, there's a lot to see. And that is Radical Women, Latin American Art from 1960 to 1985. And um, as was mentioned, it's an exhibit that, um, it's the first art exhibition to explore the groundbreaking contributions to contemporary art by Latin American and Latina women artists during a period of extraordinary conceptual and aesthetic experimentation. It features 123 artists from 15 countries and it focuses on their use of the female body for political and social critique and artistic expression. Many works were created under harsh political and social conditions, some due to US intervention in Central and South America, which were compounded by the artists' experiences as women. So many of these artists were working under military regimes and under the continued threat of torture and violence. For me, one of the things that I think is really powerful about this exhibit and some of the uh, artwork is, is in a loop behind us um, right now, is the way in which um, the, ex the exhibit makes this point. It, it really pushes us to understand how each artist's individual location in, that, in her society um, and her identity within that society pushes her to embrace a radical point of view, both in terms of her politics and in terms of the medium, the artistic mediums that, that she is um, exploring, which I think is a really interesting and a powerful kind of combination. So I wanted to begin the conversation by thinking about 
by hearing from each of you a little bit about this, this word radical. We see it a lot lately. It pops up everywhere. Everybody's talking about something being radical. And so there's a sense, A, that there's like a yearning for this idea, but also there's this way in which sometimes it's used in a very sloppy way, just any old kind of way, anything is all of a sudden radical. Um, so my first question for all of you, and feel free to jump in as you feel, as you feel it, um, is around this idea of what is this word for you? We know that the, 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 the word radical comes from the word root, which implies the idea of getting to the core of something, like pulling out a weed by its root, or maybe for some people the idea of being grounded. What does this idea of radical mean to you? Maybe I'll start. First of all, I want to thank you for hosting this uh, conversation. I think it is uh, timely, and I want to welcome everyone in the audience. I see a lot of women and also men, and I think it's, uh, it's a good time to have these um, talks. And the fact that everybody is attracted to the word radical, I think, is a good thing. But as you said, uh, there are some pitfalls. Um, I also want to clarify that I was not the first woman in the Young Lords. I was among the first, and that's been a frequent mistake that people make, but I don't want to take credit where it's not due. So in terms of radical for me, I think about time and place. And as you suggested, radical is both content and form. And so when I say time and place, I, I became an activist in, in, in the 60s uh, uh, by protesting against the war in Vietnam. So I, I place it there because I think we have to understand the conditions that we're living in order to understand the word radical. And the, the conditions will then dictate to us what looks radical and what doesn't. For example, I recently was speaking uh, to some students in California, and I said to them, Puerto Rico is a colony. And I said, I'm not saying anything to you that you don't know. And as a matter of fact, I, I saw, sound kind of Main Street, I said to them. And uh, I said, and they, they nodded that indeed I did. And why? 50 years ago when you said that, 40 years ago when you said that Puerto Rico was a colony, it was radical, right? Because it challenged the norm of what was accepted by society. I also said to them, maybe to liven up the conversation a little bit, uh, I said to them, we have today in the White House, thieves, criminals, rapists, murderers, and they nodded. And I said, I'm pretty mainstream. <laughs> Again, if uh, I had said that at another point in time, which in fact the young Lord said things close to that about different presidents, we would be considered radical. So I, I think it's important to understand the conditions that we live in, our relationship to that word, but also it's important for, for us to know that radical for an organization like the Young Lords or the movements of the 60s meant a transformation of society. Mm -hmm. And that we were talking about um, you know, as, as Richie Perez said, a top-to-down transformation of society. And so we struggled a lot with what is the relationship between reform and revolution. And the word radical somehow mixes up in there. Mm -hmm. Again, for us, I think you have to understand your conditions in order to be able to organize your com uh, community for revolution or, or reform. 
for either one. You have to really understand your community. And when you don't understand your community and the conditions that you live in, you can't have a social movement. I want to leave it there. I mean, I think at this point, even language like radical is unattainable to most brothers and sisters or non-gender conforming people in the hood, in the streets, you know, working two or three jobs. So I see it as a very now academic leftist term. And I mean, I would say we're living in radical times of the xenophobia and white supremacy, but we don't have radical organizations on the, on the left or I don't even, you know, there's a black left and a white left and a Marxist, Leninist left. And I think none of that is addressing these times. Mm. You know, so when Iris said about time and place, the exhibit's from 60 to 85, right? right? That exhibit is amazing, but there's a complete erasure of blackness. Mm. It's visible, but then when you look at who the, most of the artists are, what they look like, what they might have represented more around addressing class conditions and, and, and the condition of the woman, as opposed to maybe like a global black liberation ideology or radical imagination, like how you had said earlier that Robin Kelly has talked about. Mm -hmm. So if I think of radical, that's what we need to be. Like what is a black radical imagination that envisions a complete new system of living and how we live as a people? as a global black people. So I think a lot of terms now can be trendy and are very academic-y and they can be in journals and panels, which is critically important because I think when you're seeing a country go towards fascism, that discourse and debate and the sharing of ideas is the most critical thing we could be doing now. But on top of that, we need to be building like true organizations and institutions that are addressing the material conditions of our people. Mm -hmm. um, so I see that now as a, you know, how are we as organizers, I don't use the term activists to describe myself, activists are people who can maybe donate or sign a petition or might show up at something. Organizers, we learn to become leaders and what failure looks like in a movement, what a win looks like in a movement. So I think all these things are necessary if we're gonna move towards a radical revisioning of what the world should be about. And I think that's what we need now, like radical visionaries. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say when I think of the definition of the word, word radical, uh, what I see it used to describe a lot of the times it's used to explain people or movements that are outside of the box of what general society considers normal or average or typical. And when people outside of that start fighting for their own necessities is when it's usually depicted as radical. Instead of considering the fact that, you know, when black people are fighting for their liberation, instead of it be being considered radical, that's just, that's people fighting for their necessities, for their humanity, for their existence. And I think that there's a lot of erasure of that. You know, people turn it into policies and laws and things that exist in a more tangible way and take it away from the actual emotion of what creates this r radicalness is coming from pure human necessity and survival. And in a lot of situations, that's what the main runner is and that's what's mainly motivating people and that no one's considering that. And a lot of movements are considered radical until maybe the typical middle aged white liberal picks up on it and then all of a sudden it's mainstream. Um, I think you could talk about black students who forever have been fighting against gun violence in their schools and in their regular day to day life and as soon as a different type of person picks up on it, all of a sudden it's less radical and more mainstream and more able to access it. And usually once those people co-opt it, you're forgetting actual things that the community was fighting for in the first place. Like for example, I think of how radical it could be considered that students for years, black students for years have been fighting against having school resource, safety resource officers in their schools 
And then all of a sudden, when we look at gun violence in a different context, or maybe in a white context, students, white students are talking about having extra police officers in the schools, something that doesn't even scratch the surface of what gun violence is to a black person, mm -hmm. but seems to embody how we can protect young people from gun violence for a white person. So, so that's really interesting, because then you also bring up this, this idea of the gaze, right? Depending on who's doing the looking, if it, for those people over there, those people over there saying that, that's radical, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, Rosa, you started, you, you touched on this idea, and I know, um, Iris, we've talked about this a little bit um, also. Um, you know, we're here in um, an art museum, and there's, uh, and, and we think a lot about what this thing is that we call art. I think the, the this museum has been more open than others to uh, opening up a little bit that concept beyond just something that you put on the wall, although of course we have lots of things on, on the wall here also. Um, but, you know, both Robin Kelly, Angela Davis, many folks talk about this idea of the, of the black radical imagination um, and how essential it is to to help us imagine liberation. This idea that if we're not just gonna be um, reacting to oppression and reacting to it by you know, fighting against it, I mean, that's important, we need to do that, but then how do we also practice this imagination mu muscle so that we can even think of something else instead of constantly just being defined by the thing that we're fighting against. So I wonder how this connects to this idea of art, this idea of creativity, and is, and, and you know, if we think about these ideas beyond just the walls of a museum, how does it intersect to your understanding of um, radical politics and organizing? The idea of creativity, the idea of art, the idea of culture, that realm of things, how does this connect to to the work that you do on the ground and, and to how you understand organizing. To be an organizer, you have to be creative and you have to be innovative. Um, again, I was thinking of something that happened recently and then I'll talk more specific, uh, more generally or more theoretically about it, but uh, I was supposed to make a presentation at a church recently this, earlier this week, I think I've lost track of time. Um, and there was a young organizer, 23 year old organizer who had put the whole event together and it was supposed to be an exchange with uh, some young environmental justice activists. Even though you don't like the word. Um, in any event, <laughs> in any event, so we're standing outside the church and they're, um, they had food catered, you know, rice, uh, penil, a bunch of Puerto Rican food. And the young woman was very anxious because it was like 10 minutes to the church opening and the church wasn't open yet. So I knew she was a new organizer and I was trying to calm her so that she wouldn't feel bad um, and she said, so I said to her, maybe they're late people. I said, but even if they're late people, maybe we should have a backup plan. And across the way was a, a museum with a, a big wide uh, open space and a section for children to play in the park. And I said to her, if, um, if you want, we can set up and do the event across the way. Let's see if we find the opening. And she says, well, what if the police come? I said, well, we'll deal with it when the police come. <laughs> I said, because there are people here for the event and you have the food, we've got the people, so let's go for it. And the only thing that, that we need to do is to vary the program a little bit and because you know it's open space and we couldn't have a conversation like this. So that's what we did. So that's creativity, right? And that's flexibility. 
and people accepted it. And the, you know, I welcomed everyone, and I, I said, I said, organizers and activists have to be flexible and have to be creative, mm -hmm. and that's what we did. Mm -hmm. um, the Young Lords were successful in many movements of the 60s. The, if you look at the Black Panther Party, our success was based in creativity. And whether it was the taking over of a hospital or taking over of a TV truck, and I've often said that some of these actions were performance art. Mm -hmm. if, you look, if you look at the photographs with all the uh, uh, posters of all the iconic figures of that time, <laughs> and, and the berets and the, uh, you know, so, it, right? Performance art. So, and the people loved it because uh, it's a way of communicating and creativity is about communicating and reaching the soul of people. That's really what art is about, is about reaching the soul of people and having people think about things differently. Mm -hmm. And that whole era was creative because we went against the official story. Mm -hmm. The official story that said we were inferior, we were nobodies, we were just supposed to be workhorses, you know, spicks and niggers. That's what we were. And we, we flipped it. Mm -hmm. And we say we're black and we proud, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and we changed the way we dressed. We changed the way we spoke. We thought about values in a different way, what was important to us. We taught ourselves our history. And that was innovative and that was artistic. And we spawned creative movements. We informed each other, the people that were on the front lines doing the so-called political work informed the people that were so-called the artistic work, was, which is really a Western division, right? Because everything around us is art. Mm -hmm. And sometimes something can be artistic or it can be functional. So um, the role of creativity and art is very integral to organizing and to art. Yeah, I mean, I think that question is interesting, especially because part of what we do is tell the truth, or we have to, even when it's uncomfortable. So when the Brooklyn Museum, there's been controversy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. the truth is that you know, it's not only the controversy of Brooklyn being completely gentrified and in like 10 years there'll be hardly any black or brown people in Brooklyn, New York, and that's the truth. And so-called white allies, which I hate, or white accomplices are gonna have to come to the realization that they've created this mess. And they're, they're reaping and enjoying the benefits of it. And now their go-to model is calling the police anytime they feel uncomfortable. <laughs> like, that's happening everywhere. But the Brooklyn Museum and the controversy around who gets hired to curate what essentially comes down to these institute. We think that at this point, these institutions have let us be part of their institution that we progressed. And to me, until we no longer as black and brown people see ourselves through the white lens and a white gaze as Toni Morrison, then we're not progressing. And and part of it is that what we have is not enough because now we're a people that have consistently now for over 100 years, 150 years in this American failure of a project have been in, in this mode of survival. We've never been allowed to thrive. Mm -hmm. So what would it mean for all these institutions to finally just let black people lead them where they need to go? If the majority of the world is black, then why aren't the majority of our institutions from top to bottom run by black people, run by black and brown women, run by non-gender conforming, queer folks, all the folks that have already been marginalized, but yet we still keep giving chances to white mediocrity. Like, white people could do whatever and still within three years ascend to run something. You're like, that's crazy. Just on the, the level of That's like, you have action. to have some knowledge 
At least put five years in the game before you get <laughs> promoted, you know, to run things that are going to literally impact the imagination of young people, right? Now, now, that's not to say that the majority of the people working here at the Brooklyn Museum were like, really, that's what it's going to, like we told y'all, like there's like 20,000 people <laughs> that are black and Latino with MFAs and been doing and curating and all this. What makes then, you know, what is that? I mean, that's the essence of white supremacy and how it controls anything and everything in that way. So I think one of the things is we always have to acknowledge that and we have to be very clear with young folks because then young people feel let down. And that's why in the last five to seven years, you've seen a new wave of what black and brown organizing looks like, young people challenging gender norms and, and questioning certain things and saying, you know, what does this leadership look like? The flip side of that has been because of this white gaze, even these young people that have broken some of the old stagnant ways of organizing, they actually believe that visibility and ag ag you know, awards and adulation from the system means they've broken something. Mm -hmm. So they actually think they're doing stuff radical and it's like, look, you know, and this is coming from me. I went to the, we're going to the Golden Globe but the, it was crazy the amount of people the next day that were like, oh, you got money now? Like, you making a move? I'm like, what are you talking about? The stuff that we're still talking about on that red carpet is not getting us invited the next day. Mm -hmm. the, the couple times you're in a magazine and all that, that's just visibility. That's not power. And sometimes the system rewards in order to absorb radicalism. And that's what we have to be telling younger folks when you're doing this work, the ego, don't get caught up. What does language mean? How does it translate? What, what are you doing that's actually shifting the power paradigm? Are we still creating the same things in a hierarchical sense instead of vertical organizing or using democratic principles or pushing past these old lenses or too many of my generation and younger generations have this romanticism about the 60s and the 70s without understanding that the minute that the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense or the Black Liberation Army, the Young Lords Party or Los Machateros, first, these were paramilitary organizations. They were not civil rights organizations. They weren't petitioning the courts to change conditions. They were doing it. Because they also were paramilitary organizations, the state literally put its entire weight of the government amongst them. So when J. Edgar Hoover says that the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense is the greatest, greatest internal security threat to the United States of America, the second organization was not even an organization, it was the Puerto Rican independence movement that they targeted. So anybody working and why because we're a colony, but what does that mean? And militarily, all of this stuff. Like young people have to understand that a lot of what happened between the 60s and 1985 was a purposeful, purposeful destruction of movements that were radical. So if we're gonna move into that radical phase, we have to start with truth telling, and then we have to prepare for the weight of the United States government coming at us. Because that's how they've always operated. And that was in secret. In 2018, there's no secret. Mm -hmm. There's no secret to who they're targeting with these ICE raids. Right. There's no secret to who, what Muslims they might want banned. There's no secret to who they're incarcerating. There's no secret now that last week the FBI had to admit that it's been surveilling so-called Black Lives Matter activists over 580 that they have yet to name because they've redacted. But eventually we will find out. So the FBI for three years, started under Barack Obama, has been surveilling 585 Black Lives Matter activists. Seven connected to Black Lives Matter in the last year have been murdered or died mysteriously. Like this is real. And I don't say all of that to scare young people. What I'm saying is that that then begins at least to have younger people who are doing this work 
not only to like Richie would always tell us to up the ante, Richie Perez would always be like, you think what you're doing is radical, get to the next level. And what that means, I think it also is gonna require a psychological shift of how we think and who we're doing the work for. Yeah. You know, I think it's psychological a lot of this right now. Yeah. yeah. And again, that connects to the idea of like where the imagination and working the imagination, why that's not just fluff on the side, how yeah. that's actually definitely. essential. Victoria, you wanna jump in there? Yeah, um, definitely when I'm thinking about art and activist movements, so a lot of what I think about goes to the fact that um, art is a really good way for people who don't necessarily have the coded language and the academic language to talk about their movements could represent their feelings. Art is a way to portray raw emotion and raw feelings. And I think especially when you're talking about experience and this idea of experience, we have to consider that people's lived experiences are like a qualification. People's existences are a qualification. Being a black woman in America is makes you qualified hmm. to, you know, <laughs> talk yeah. about topics that deal with black women in America. And you don't yeah. necessarily need to have a PhD in African American and gender studies to be able to talk about the experience of being a black woman in America. And, you know, I think about, you know, going to college and everything and going to school, a lot of that is so that people, of, a lot of the reason that people of color strive to get into these institutions is so that we could access this guarded, coded academic language that language Western, power that Western society has told us is necessary in order to be successful in today's world and today's necessity and, and what's going on is today and then you need a piece of paper to prove that you've got those as words and you have that language to do that. And art is a great way because communication, like language communication, word communication is flawed. There's not always a perfect way to portray what you're saying or what you're feeling in a way that people understand. And I think that art puts a lot of the ability and capability into people's hands to be able to portray whatever they're feeling and whatever their experiences are and however they're existing in the world in a way that could impact people because we've seen that words aren't enough and especially if you don't have access to the type of words that people consider elite. Like I think of the environmental movement, a lot of the environmental movement has always been dominated by white students who go to private schools that go to Ivy League institutions because they have that academic language to talk about how complex climate change is, but they don't have that experience of living in a flood zone because you're black or having poisoned water because you're black or like understanding these concepts of environmental racism and environmental justice because that's not their lived experience. They wanna talk about the academics of it and they wanna talk about why it's ethically unfair, but they could just talk to somebody who's actually experienced that ethical unfairness or look at the art that somebody's created out of that unfairness and have a way better picture of what's going on. Yeah, so it's also about epistemology. Like, how, what do we consider our ways of knowing and what are valid ways of knowing and kind of blowing that up, right? To include more ways of knowing as legitimate. Yeah. Um, whew, okay. Um, so I, I had, um, for the, you know, the, the next question that I wanted to throw out to you is, is kind of a natural, uh, a natural sequence to the question of radical politics. And I had pulled out this quote from Frederick Douglass that, that, that I always return to, that I wanted to share um, to set up this question. And, and Rosa was like, well, if you're gonna share the quote, you gotta share the whole quote, because that's not the whole quote. And so I'm going to, I want to actually um, share a bigger chunk of the quote because I think she's right in that uh, to get to kind of the full concept that, that uh, he throws out there, which is this idea that um, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground they want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one or it may be a physical one. It may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. So, 
Um, and, you know, in fact, if we think about any major significant social, political transformation that we've experienced or our parents have experienced in their lives, whether it's abolition of slavery, eight-hour workday, end of apartheid, you know, segregation down south, whatever, um, it's, it's never happened without struggle. It never happened because somebody felt bad, someone in power felt bad and decided to change it, it you know. Um, and so the radical question, I mean, the, 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 the next question with that then, uh, or is that, you know, if we really intend to radically change society, expect pushback, expect the force of the state and government in full force, as, as Rosa pointed out. Um, and that, can, that means the threat of violence, that means violence, imprisonment, other forms of intimidation. So I didn't want to ask you all, what have you learned about fear in your organizing work beyond just the theoretical? Like, how do you actually confront this idea of fear? Um, and what is your relationship to fear in your day-to-day -day life and in your organizing work? Yeah, I mean, I don't say this because I think I'm, like, superhuman, but I don't fear doing the work. And I don't fear that because I know of the sacrifice, particularly of our political prisoners, right? So Herman Bell, who by all that is good, will be walking out of prison tomorrow after 43 years locked up. You know, Oscar Lopez Rivera, the former Puerto Rican political prisoners, not just the ones in the 90s, but the sacrifice that Lolita Lebron and Rafael and Oscar made um, before, I mean, Especially as a Boricua, like, what I always tell, especially young, like, third generation Puerto Ricans is, we're the only people that have had, had three generation of political prisoners. And now with the struggle in Puerto Rico, potentially four. Right? And, you know, you, and that I've met most of the Puerto Rican political prisoners. Not because I'm superhuman, because I'm part of movement. And I've sat at the feet of Lolita, and Rafael's still here. And I remember being in college at SUNY Albany, first finding out that there were political prisoners. I grew up in the Bronx, and I didn't know that they were Puerto Rican. I had to go to college and take a black studies class and meet a professor by the name of Dr. Gordon, who then was like, you need to know who Richie Perez is. Richie. It's crazy. It's crazy. You know, and... And then now to have seen who came out and then to know that Oscar Lopez Rivera could have gotten out in the 90s, but he didn't want to leave one of his comrades behind. So he stayed behind while the other comrade came out. And then Oscar comes out last year. And I, I named that just because every time I think, like, I'm a little bit, I'm like, F that. <laughs> and then that's just the Puerto Rican. I'm going to talk about Mumia. Leonard Peltier, Marilyn Buck, Herman um, Jalil, who's still in prison, you know, those that are still in court. David Gilbert gave up his and to make sure Sada Shakur was free, Sada, William Morales, Nahanda Abi Odun. See, these are the names that we really need to look to, like when we make these altars or like who's that guiding light? Because a lot of times in, in, you know, we'll say Sojourner True important, Ida B. Wells, Fannie Lou Hamer, and so many of the Puerto Rican independence um, leaders, but I think of these people who have literally sat in the dungeons of hell for four to five decades now. So that's to me, that's why I'm like, I don't necessarily have that type of fear, but what I will say is that I've become very aware of the consequences of being very politically stringent in how I roll. And the first time I really felt the impact of the consequences of what I felt was the right political choice was when I did accept the nomination to run, um, on the vice, uh, to run as vice president with Cynthia McKinney when we ran in 2008. We were the first and only woman of color ticket in American presidential politics. And I, I was living in, in, in Brooklyn and, you know, I was struggling with my family. And she called me, and I was like, I need a job. Y'all giving me a stipend? And she was like, yup. And I'm like, let's go. 
<laughs> and the other reason too was because I had been one of the co-founders of the National Hip Hop Political Convention. My great mentor, Richie Perez, had passed by now. And I just remember she asking me, and I look, I'm looking at the Green Party platform, and I said, if you would all accept that Puerto Rico needs to be decolonized, the Palestinian right of return, and something around mass incarceration and, and climate, our racial climate stuff into your platform, taking it from the National Hip Hop Political uh, Convention platform, I will run. And they accepted that in a, in a meeting around the platform. All that being said, we were nominated. And I really thought that my comrades, people that I had gone to jail with, been in rooms with, been in organizations, founded organizations with, and I mean my comrades, my peer group, my hip hop generation, I just automatically assumed people would be like, yo, Rose is running, she's running on a hip hop political platform, let's go. And that didn't happen. I have friends that called, well, former friends, or f they weren't really ever comrades, that that day called me and said my life was ruined and I've never heard from them since. For almost two years, me and Cynthia didn't, could not work. Like imagine anybody else running for vice president or whatever and not being able to find a job. And I remember I was all down, depressed, I'm living in the Bronx, I'm like, my husband's formerly incarcerated, I'm like, I can't believe I have these degrees, this debt, I did all this and all of this. And Pam Africa, I don't know if you all know who Pam Africa is, from the Move family, called me and she said, I know something's wrong. She's like, but remember, in this game of politics and a revolution, it's a long distance struggle and consistency is the name of the game. You're gonna get through this. What do you wanna do? I said, I wanna go get my PhD. She said, apply and the next year I was in my PhD program. I say that because I think especially for young women of color, like politics in general is one of the most treacherous games. After that is that academy. <laughs> um, be, try being a woman of color finishing your PhD. Um, and the amount of men around you who you thought should be your brothers don't wanna see you succeed. And I had to deal with a lot of, uh, I had to let go of a lot of romanticism and being naive. I didn't have to let go of my politic. I just had, knew that now you're this age, you have a daughter, you've made choices, you're gonna have to always deal with the consequences of your choices. And then how are you gonna get through that financially? How are you gonna get through that to the next level? How are you gonna make sure that what, you believe in even if everybody's leaving you to the side is in line with what your ancestors and your elders have taught you and actually what history employs. And I know I took a little time with this answer because I often see too many young women of color by the time they're like 28, like I'm done with the movement. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You don't need self care, you don't need a massage right now. Like, what are you talking about? You want self-care after being three months as an organizer? Try being now Fannie Lou or Harriet, being like, I'm gonna keep going back. Let's go, you know, more people would have been free. Try spending 40 years in jail. You gotta have, part of this work too requires that you have to have, you have to be tough. There are times where you're just like, I have to shut all this down this is not about me liking you and wanting to go to the bar with you later or dance with you at the next gala. This is about like, can, are we comrades? Do you have my back when it's bad? Can I talk to you when my mental health is not doing good or my physical health? What does it mean to have comrades say to you, you, no, you're doing too much now. Now you're killing yourself. We don't need martyrs in all this. I, it took me, I'm telling you from about 2008 till I would say about 2014, that six year period, I, I experienced so much growth, you know, and if I had at one moment been like, oh, I'm done, it was hard, it was a 10 year thing, I'm good, I'm gonna go this way, I wouldn't be where I am and you know, I wouldn't be definitely modeling for my daughter 
what unfortunately my mom could not model for me, not because of her fault, just because she didn't have access to what I have had access to, which is our history of resistance and our movements as a people, you know. So, sorry it took a little long. No, I mean, I think what's so powerful for young what sisters, I, need, I, I hope that they understand yeah. that, you know. And I think part of what you are lifting up to is that, you know, when we talk about um, violence and, and, and pushback, and the, it's not just about, um, you know, the threat of, of death and being put in jail, although it's that too, but it's, it's, it's much broader and deeper than that. You know, it's all the ways that, um, that, uh, that we need to survive in, in, in living under systemic system, like systemic oppression which is all, you know, so thank you for that because I think it opens up to, in a much broader way what it means to resist and what it means to be strategic when we're dealing um, and trying to survive under these systems, yeah. Yeah, my response is gonna make me seem really soft. <laughs> but um, basically what I think I've learned a lot about fear, especially being in college now and doing that much more big picture thinking that I guess college is known for is, is that, you know, I used to think about how I would answer in interviews, especially being a young climate activist and climate being a topic that is literally about like the continued existence of our planet and the human race. Um, I get asked a lot, you know, are you afraid? How do you deal with your fear? And I think I realized recently that I was always very naive in my response because I always say my fear is what motivates me you know, like, it's what makes me excited to keep doing things, it what makes me all of this, and I realize now that I was just thinking about that in the context of climate change, because there's this confidence in me, like, oh, well, we'll solve that. But I realize that, you know, what I'm actually afraid of, and I think this is what I notice being in school, and especially going to the University of Wisconsin, Madison, which is, there's 43,000 students at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Um, and I'm pretty sure about 700 of them are black. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a predominantly white institution and it's in Wisconsin. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and it's in Madison, which we were talking about earlier, has its own other layer of complexity because Madison is a liberal bastion and it's the capital city. And you know it's always been known for uh, being really radical in, in, with its students and everything like that. But I think what I'm realizing and like seeing all these people around me and like leaving the city and leaving my small private school and like realizing how many types of people exist and how many various opinions exist. And I think lately I realized what my fear is rooted in is less of like the system or less of like being arrested at a protest and more about just the knowledge that like, there are so many people who are against you know, what we're doing and what we feel. And like, there's, might not, there's not this reality that can exist where maybe like the progressive agenda wins because there's always going to be that like oppositional group. Like it, right now as a young activist, I think what, I, and I don't know if this has a positive ending to the answer of this question, but I think what a lot of my fear lies in is like, how do you fix the disjointedness when so many people feel so strongly about the opinions that they already believe in, you know? Yeah. And it's like, for example, um, I was talking to my sister about this yesterday. Um, there's, yet yesterday night, we had a conservative speaker on campus named Dennis Prager. I don't know if any of you have heard of Prager University but it's an online um, YouTube channel that basically teaches young people um, conservative values. So for example, I tried to watch like one minute of a video. Um, the top, one of the videos was the top five issues facing black Americans. And of course they got a black guy to do it because like <laughs> that they had to do that. But the first, the first thing, number five, was um, victimization. You know, and I was like, oh my God. And the reason he even came to campus was to talk about Judeo-Christian morality and basically 
um, he was talking about transgender people and how you, he believes transgender people exist, but they're only, they only have the mental health issue of gender dysphoria. And just all this <laughs> messed up stuff. And it's like students on my campus, a club at my campus invited him to come speak. You know, students at my campus are going to go watch him speak. And it's like, they're going to go listen to him and listen to all the things he's saying and still be white and still be cis and still be ha sitting in that room and like not have any idea that all these opinions that they hold and all these things that they uphold. It's like, I'm just trying to see how you teach people to care about other people. And like, that's where a lot of my fear lies right now. So what if it's not always possible? Yeah. How to hold that? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's where I'm at right now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's hard to follow all of that because all of those fears are real. And um, there are different kinds of fears. I guess that's what we've been talking about. And there's uh, the fear of s state violence. And then there's the individual fear that we may have within our community even that we face um, violence when we walk certain places and that, that reflects the uh, uh, oppression of our communities and our internalized uh, colonized mentality where we take out on each other and so there's that fear. And I think uh, as young activists, you may be afraid, I remember being afraid for the first action. Like you, you, your blood starts pumping your adrenaline and you're afraid. And for me, it was how to overcome the fear, how to be able to act in spite of the fear and not let the fear mobilize, immobilize me. And part of that came from being able to rely on, on other comrades and see how they were dealing with it and, and knowing that what we were doing was bigger than all of us and that we had other people that had gone before us and that's why the study of our history is so important and of our social movements to understand that you know other people have done very brave things and that um, and that we have survived because of it, because if, if someone didn't along the line, we wouldn't have survived. Um, in my travels recently, I met a woman from Honduras who um, is part of the Garifuna movement, and she was talking about the fear that groups of women, when they go to demonstrate, feel and someone asked this question in the audience and she said, you live with the fear, you always live with the fear of state sanctioned violence, but you also believe so strongly that it's almost like a spiritual calling and something greater than what is, you know, that goes back to your vision of, of what you imagine that we can do and that we can be the people that we can be and the road that we're on that, that helps you deal with, with your fear. Um, I wanted to add to what uh, Rosa was saying about sometimes within our movements, we become afraid um, from, our, from the people we're struggling with because um, differences of ideas people turn violent on one each other. Again, that's part of our internalized oppression and about ideological struggle, and I have also experienced that. And that, I think, is the most hurtful fear because it is among your own brothers and sisters, your own people, you know, it's a betrayal that's uh, difficult to overcome, and yet we must we must because uh, these are not our enemies. You know, these are among us. Uh, these are not the people that have the power to exploit us really. Um, 
they were also victims, but that's a hard one. That's a hard one. Um, you know, I was a, a victim of that kind of situation. I don't talk about it too much, although I did put it in my book. <laughs> but I somehow feel... <laughs> But, but I also say in there, which was important for me to say, um, that, you know, I forgave him and that I have actually uh, sat on the same stage and spoken with, you know, to done speaking engagements and stuff. But, uh, <laughs> no, I think it's because, you know, I have this, this deep belief that um, that we can create a society and that we can, um, if the person is still a screw up, I'm not forgiven. I have those in my life too. But if it's someone that, you know, has reconciled and has, you know, moved forward, I think we also have to learn to forgive. It's part of our own transformation. And, um, you know, the fear is going to be there. At different times, it becomes more uh, obvious because, you know, you're in a demonstration, your people are getting hit over the head or thrown in prison, or, um, and at other times, it seems less. You know, uh, the FBI, my FBI file begins when I was 19 on my way to Cuba in Mexico, way before the Young Lords. And um, when I ordered the, f the files, when you could still get them, um, and I saw that that's when they started following me in Mexico City, I was shocked, because I thought surely it would have been with the Young Lords. And I was nobody. I mean, I was really nobody. I was a, a college student. I was an organizer, had been an organizer before that. But in terms of the scheme of things, I wasn't, you know, one of the leaders in the national movement, which to me also indicates that people think they can get away from things and that at the end of the day, if you have a repressive government, and this is what the art exhibit is about, women that lived under very repressive re regimes, which means nobody gets away. And so that's the reality why we all have to fight because nobody gets away mm -hmm. at the end of the day. I was nobody. Yeah. And, and I think that moment is, uh, you know, there's an echo right now. There's, and, I, I, and sometimes I feel like we don't fully, it's not quite clicking um, that uh, this is the direction that, that we're heading, that we're already in. So, how are you guys doing out there? I wanted to continue, and, but now I wanted to kind of zoom in and ask each person a particular question, kind of connected to your trajectory, but then invite other folks to jump in. Um, and um, Edis, I thought that I'd start with you. Um, and there's, I think there's a, some images that, that we can put up for this particular section. Um, so um, Edie's as has come up now a couple of times, and I, I'm sure a lot of folks know this, but from 1969 to 1975, you were a member of the radical New Yorican, Puerto Rican organization known as the Young Lords Party. And um, yeah. And there's some images um, in the background, specifically of the women in the Young Lords Party, just so that people have a, a visual, a sense of who, of who was there on the ground, who were, who were EDC's comrades at that time. Um, and some of the roles that you had during that time period included being Deputy Minister of Education and co-founder of the Women's Caucus and Women's Union, among other roles. Um, the Young Lords Party was inspired by the Black Panther Party and had a 13-point program and platform um, that, as I understand it, went through a couple uh, different iterations. Um, 
And I, I have actually the, the platform here, and maybe I'll just read um, quickly the, the, the headings of the 13 um, points. And this is the original version, not the final version. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so number one, we want self-determination for Puerto Ricans, liberation for the island and inside the United States. We want self-determination for all Latinos. We want liberation of all third world people. We are revolutionary nationalists and oppose racism. We want community control of our institutions and land. We want a true education of our Creole culture and Spanish language. We oppose capitalists and alliances with traitors. We oppose the American military. We want freedom for all political prisoners. We want equality for women. Machismo must be revolutionary, not oppressive. We fight anti-communism with international unity. We believe armed self-defense and armed struggle are the only means to liberation. We want a socialist society. So I wanted to ask the question, A, um, how did your participation in the, in the party inform and nurture um, your commitment to radical politics? Um, and also, how did you see the understanding of, of radical politics or revolutionary politics shift and evolve during your time within the, the party? Um, and also for yourself, as you, as you moved out of the party and joined other movements and other struggles, how has your own understanding of radical revolutionary politics perhaps evolved or shifted or grown or stayed the same? That's a whole lot of questions. I know. <laughs> it's a whole lot of questions uh, folded into one. So I'll start first that uh, the 13-point program uh, changed. Um, basically, I still believe in the 13-point program. And if you look at the Women's Union 12-point program, I believe in that one. Um, there were a couple of things that changed. One was the Creole one. Um, we did, that was changed to talk about uh, Taino and African uh, heritage and culture, and which was an, an important change. And the other, of course, was the revolutionary machismo, which everybody knows about because we said, you know, the program was written by, by two men and we said, you know, uh, you can't, there's no, no such thing as revolutionary machismo. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So, so uh, we were clear about that. But it took, us, it took us about a year to change the program because they were like stuck to it. And uh, so then we talked about the revolution within the revolution. Mm. Um, the organization changed uh, over time. Well, let me say that before I was in the Young Lords, I was already, I already uh, believed that uh, the U.S. government and a capitalist system was not in the benefit, was not beneficial for poor people. Remember, I had already traveled to Cuba, and so I was very influenced by uh, socialism and the Cuban Revolution. Um, but the fact that I really wanted to go to Cuba also had to do with my developing political consciousness, which I always say, say started because I grew up poor. And so if you grow up poor, you understand poverty, you understand class. And if you grow up poor and you grow up in, in black and you grow up in a family that can't speak English and you become uh, the go-between, the translator you get, I always say, that's the way I got to know the institutions. So I got to know, you know, w the disdain with which the hospitals treated us, the emergency room and the schools when they would scold my mother for not speaking English. And so, you know, my politic, I became political, th uh, the lived experience, as you mentioned earlier. And uh, so by the time I got in the Young Lords, I was already, 
I, that's why I joined the Young Lords, right? Um, and I was part of a world, I felt I was part of a worldwide movement, which we were because it wasn't just the Young Lords and the Black Panthers, but it was an international movement and, and people all over the world were fighting colonialism and were fighting for freedom and justice. And so I saw myself as part of that, and I continue to see myself as part of that. Um, but conditions change. One of the things that I say to young people is that sometimes you're in the middle of history and you don't see what you're in the middle of. And so we were at a point in the latter point, um, two things that happened, uh, but I'll talk about the second one first. We were in, in a moment when neoliberalism was taking hold, when everything was being privatized, when factories were moving out of, of the United States and the cities were being decimated and people didn't have jobs. We were in that moment and in the Young Lords and in many organizations of the left, we were sending people to organize in the factories. We, we, we failed to understand the moment that we were in. And that often happens when, when you're in, involved in, in revolutionary struggle. So that created um, demoralization for an entire movement because uh, we felt like we failed, you know, and people went off in different directions. And it took time to kind of adjust to the new reality that we no longer had an organization, a movement, the way that we had grown up in it. And so then we each had to find our way. We were used to working collectively. I love collective working. And I try and create collectives all the time now, wherever I go, let's create a collective, right? <laughs> um, but that meant that we were each trying to find our own way to continue the struggle. You know, so some people went to build schools, some people went to create women's organizations, some people went to, you know, I, w I went to do all of the above, created schools for young people, um, a publishing company now is the latest thing to do a film to document our struggles so that our stories don't get lost for the next generation continue to work. You know, I'm, I'm the oldest person on this panel. So, um, so I've done a lot of different things to try and stay connected uh, to the struggle because the basic principles, I still believe in all of them including the Vende Patrias, which we don't talk about too much today. And, you know, having been in Puerto Rico and seeing the role that um, is being played by not only the governor, but by so many corrupt upper middle class or whatever folks. And we have to talk about the Vende Patrias. We, you know, we can't not not talk about them. Um, and that was the other mistake that we made that I think is relevant for us today, which is uh, the young lords took a turn to go organize the independence struggle in Puerto Rico. And that was a mistake because you couldn't organize the independence movement of Puerto Rico from here. And the reason that I mentioned that as very important today is because Puerto Rico is now at a crossroads. Um, and the movement that is developing is among uh, younger folk that are talking about sustainability. And some of the, the people in my generation say, well, we should be pushing independence, we should be pushing this, and I said, that's not how I hear the young folks talking about it. They're talking about self-determination, sustainability, you know, uh, growing our own food. Puerto Rico grows, uh, uh, imports 92%, growing our own food, solar energy, you know. And remember, it's the people of Puerto Rico that have to 
make the decision about uh, the, the status of the island. Because I hear a lot of people from here saying what Puerto Rico needs. Now I do believe we all need to keep uh, alive and in this country the issue of what is happening in Puerto Rico right now, colonial uh, uh, um, disaster colonialism or climate colonialism, you know. I recently made a presentation where I said, you have to look at colonialism. I was talking about this, the struggle in Penuelas. I know I'm go going off a little bit, but I really feel that the issue of Puerto Rico is critical and that we have so much to learn from the activists there because they're right, they're right at the edge. You know, they're right at the edge and everything, you're a climate justice activist, so you know that everything that is toxic in this country gets uh, sent to the global south mm -hmm. and it gets sent to Puerto Rico. And the ashes is, you know, the, some of you may have heard about the struggle against coal ash in Penuelas, 300,000 tons a year that they want to dump on, on in Puerto Rico. That's in addition to the Superfund. This, I mean, the environmental uh, issues in Puerto Rico are incredible and they tried to dump these ashes in the Dominican Republic and they did and the people got sick, ba deformed babies and the Dominican uh, Republic sued because the people pressured them and the company AES had to leave uh, the Dominican Republic and then they decided, well, they're gonna dump it in Puerto Rico. And why? Because Puerto Rico has no sovereignty and can't kick them out. And the governor is in cahoots. So my commitments, this is a long way <laughs> to say that my commitment continues and it continues very strong and it will continue until mm -hmm. I meet my ancestors wherever I meet them. Ashe. Yeah. Well, maybe since you brought up um, Puerto Rico and some of the environmental issues that are happening there, I think I'm going to jump to Victoria and then I'll, I'll bring it back to Rosa. Um, I wanted to ask a question in particular of you and some of the work that you've been doing. Um, and when I was thinking about um, and, and looking at some of the videos and researching some of the work that you've been involved with, um, I was thinking about myself as a, as a high school organizer in Boston. Uh-oh. Okay, we're going to get to y'all. Prepare your questions. Coming your way soon. Um, and at the time, I was um, organizing with other young people in Roxbury. And I was a part of an organization called Free My People. But one of the things in, in our thing was we were really focused on the anti-apartheid movement and connecting it to, to um, the segregation and, and, and history of busing in Boston and kind of seeing the similarities there. But there was none of us really in my circle of folks that I saw really talking or even thinking about the environment. And I think that for a lot of, of, of young people that were organizers, at least that I was around, we all kind of, and I think you talked about this, we all associated that like, oh, that's, that's something that white people do. They're the ones that, they, they care about animals and the environment, and they're, but that's like not at all, you know, <laughs> related to, 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 you know, real issues that people deal with or something. That was kind of how we thought about it. And, um, you know, one of the things that's been really inspiring for me is to see um, what up and coming organizers, youth organizers, the ways in which there's a generation of folks that are bringing in so many uh, different aspects of identity and, and of thinking of the world in general and kind of connecting those dots. Um, and so I wanted to, to talk with you a little bit about, um, in particular, the federal lawsuit that you participated in, which was filed by 21 young Americans between the ages of 10 and 21 
um, on be and on behalf of future generations against the United States government, several of its executive branches, including President Donald Trump and former President Barack Obama. And the plaintiffs allege that through the United States government's affirmative actions that cause climate change, that it has in fact violated the youngest generation's constitutional rights to life, liberty, and property, as well as failed to protect essential public trust resources. It's an unprecedented lawsuit and some articles I've read, there's a lot of kind of legal experts that, that refer to it as a radical lawsuit. And one of the things that, that has struck me is that your reaction that I've read and have heard about has been that, okay, maybe, but really the, re the reason why I've done it is because it's necessary. Um, so I wonder if you could talk with us a little bit about why is it necessary for communities of color, young people in particular, young people of color in particular, to address climate change as a social justice issue? Yeah, so <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to start with talking about maybe you know, your experience um, as a young activist and not seeing a lot of youth of color considering environmentalism as an issue of theirs is because I will be the first to admit that the environmental movement has always and still does have a huge problem with accessibility. And I think that lies in a lot of places, like I was talking before, it lies in the fact that climate change is a scientific um, human perpetuating phenomenon. And there's a lot of academic encoded language that goes into talking about it. And I even think about the idea of veganism a lot of, I've heard environmental activists say things like, you can't be an environmental activist, you can't be, care about the environment and not be a vegan, things like that. <laughs> You'd have to be, you'd have to be in a very sheltered or certain type of existence to not acknowledge the fact that veganism is not accessible to everybody. If you live in a food desert you, and you're just trying to eat, <laughs> your main option isn't like, oh, let me not eat milk, uh, not eat dairy or eggs. It's, it's important, animal agriculture is a huge con contributor to the environmental crisis, but we just have to really question what is accessible and also question, you know, how are we going to ask people who, you know, white society is constantly put on the forefront of climate disaster to make sacrifices to stop climate change. <laughs> okay, so it's like, I think a lot of what's important when it comes to people of color being in the environmental movement is what I was talking about before, with talking about experience as something that makes you qualified. You know, it's not necessarily tangible and you can't necessarily give somebody a degree for an experience, but that just has just as much worth. And it's just as important when you're talking about these conversations about climate change because you know white college students could get into rooms and talk about how terrible climate change is and how environmental racism works and how all these things work but if they don't have somebody in the room who has the experience of being a marginalized identity then it doesn't really mean anything and i think it also does have a lot to do with self-determination um the fact that young people of color are like i was saying before constantly put on the front lines of climate disaster and there's some much evidence of environmental racism in the way that we zone public housing and where people of color typically live that shows that you know a lot of white power and a lot of the government has known for a while about the environmental crisis and known for a while about the effects it's going to have and they've not only ignored it to reverse it but instead put people that they don't care about in the front lines of all its damage while pretending that they have no idea, oh, who caused that? You, you did. <laughs> so it's like, it's really important that we're getting the representation of people who actually know what's going on in the arena and actually understand what's happening. And I think even expanding it past youth of color in the United States, because as we know, climate change is an issue that happens all over the world. I, I always try to think about it, like how do we, 
and it, now I'm asking questions instead of <laughs> answering this one, but like how do we engage young people who, and, and this applies to the United States too, but I think specifically about Honduras, where my family is from, and just the way my mom's talked to me about climate change impacting Honduras and the direct impact that it especially has on grief and of people. So that's another example of environmental racism because the, the darkest skinned people in the country are the ones who are getting so heavily impacted by climate change because they make their whole living off of fishing and being a coastal community. And you know, and this is an issue that's impacting their day to day, their livelihoods, that's impacting where their houses are. But how can you ask people to be very engaged in an issue like climate change when their day to day is trying to survive in the global south country in which they're living in? And how can you ask them to do that when the United, countries like the United States are the main reason that they're even having these environmental degradations. Honduras provides like a very small percent of the carbon in the atmosphere compared to the United States, but the people that we're seeing being impacted by it, the people that we're seeing in the news that are getting hit by hurricanes and whose lands are being flooded and they can't live there anymore, they're all brown faces, so there's no way that white people can be the face of a movement that is impacting people of color because there's not at all the same context and not at all the same urgency. You could care, but it's not even, it's not the same idea. And so you really need to have people who have that quality and that qualification of lived experience, actual existence of being a person who every day sees that their government or whoever is, should be held accountable doesn't feel like being held, doesn't feel like caring about them. And those people need to be the ones who are doing what they can and really controlling the movement in any way they can. So. Thank you. So kind of connecting to that, I wanted to, and I, I, want, I have one question that I really want to kind of um, ask Rosa, and then I want to open it up to a couple questions from the audience also. Um, so connecting back to some of the conversations that we've had, I want to bring it back to this idea that, that, that um, at least kind of in, in, in the theoretical leftist circles has been framed as intersectionality. And, um, and some of you may have heard that, the, that this term was uh, coined or, or kind of, and, and that's not to say that it, that it was created, but it was coined by an African American um, scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. And, um, and in her work, she's a black feminist and she discusses this experience of being, uh, uh, she, was tr she coined the term to explain the fact that being a black woman cannot be understood in terms of being black and of being a woman considered as separate things, as independent things. Um, but that it has to necessarily include the interactions which frequently reinforce each other. Um, and Rosa, I think one of the things that's really powerful um, about your work, both as a scholar and as an activist, is the ways in which you continually lift up and address head on um, intersectional lived experiences in all kinds of ways, both as uh, Afro-Latina and being very explicit. And one of the first folks that, at least kind of in, in my realm, I saw in a very intentional way um, talk about the experience of being black and Latina and, and pushing people to hold both of those things at once instead of separately. Um, but also beyond that, um, this idea of, for example, looking at hip hop as, as both uh, uh, art and cultural form, but also in terms of the possibilities of, a, 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 of looking at it as a political organizing um, strategy. And even um, in terms of this idea that you talked about of being both scholar, grassroots organizer, and politician, like you know, having been involved in the Green Party um, as a U.S. vice presidential candidate, like how to hold all of these different experiences at once. And I'm wondering, for you, how do you understand this idea of intersectionality, and what role does it do you see it playing in 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 your work, in your organizing work? Yeah, I don't I don't use that term. Why? 
So first, Kimberly Crenshaw is, is an, a mentor of mine. And when Kimberly Crenshaw coined intersectionality, it was to censor black women and also look at what she called critical race theory and the law. So I think now it's super trendy and it means that everything is of equal necessity. And I don't believe that. Uh, so like, um, you know, I'm not saying it's not important what Kimberly has done. I'm saying that now it's been so watered down mm -hmm. that now even white men are talking about intersectionality. Y'all don't need to talk about that. <laughs> the whole world's about y'all anyway. Like, so, you know, and even like, I don't say I'm black and Latina. I say I'm a black Puerto Rican. There's no mm -hmm. and in between. Mm -hmm. None of this comes because I came to this realization. It was going to college, being exposed to the work of Arturo Schomburg, then meeting Dr. Maita Morena Vega, um, you know, beginning to even hear at that time what people were saying were um, African descendants and what it meant to be Afro Boricua and, and, and never hearing those and then beginning to understand that Puerto Rico was obvious, uh, it, it should be obvious, but you know, in doing a lot of my research on the Young Lords Party when I was doing my master's at Cornell University, I did my thesis on the Young Lords Party. And in 1996, there was only one other work out there academically. And that was also the same time period that Edis had made Palante Siempre Palante, which to this day is the only documented documentary on the Young Lords Party, which is actually highly problematic. Um, because you made that in 1996 and it's 22 years later. And we have so many movies on, you know, which is fantastic, whether the Panther Party or this era of black power, and there's still only one on, on the, and I think it's important because all of this has framed my political, the, the way I, I, I view myself and, and my politics. Right, the young lords raised up race, right? Um, but that's the lineage of a Schomburg. So I'm more, um, if anything, ideologically in the academy, I would say I'm a black and a Puerto Rican nationalist. I'm in Pan-Africanness. And um, so when I say I'm a black Puerto Rican, it's because Puerto Ricans are not a race. And I don't like the word Latina. I don't like the word Latina. I don't really like the word Latinas. What does it mean? Why was it created? It was created so that we could have another frame of reference outside of Hispanic, but it still falls within that Latin American context. And particularly for Puerto Ricans, because we're colonial subjects, it made me really understand why particularly Puerto Ricans and African Americans have always worked side by side with each other, even though there was a framing of a narrative that always talks about how black and Latino or black and, and brown people are against each other and all this kind of madness. So, you know, with that said, and me identifying as a black Puerto Rican woman. I don't get upset if somebody's like, you're Latina, you're afro Boricua, African. I don't get caught up in like language and that and get upset. And I also don't try to ever force someone to change how they identify. I think it's a very personal thing. Um, for me, I feel like it literally, my identity has been life-saving in times where I've been um, depressed and down and confused and wanting to be out the movement and stuff, and I kind of always just will go back to history and, and read Schomburg and read, um, you know, about the Young Lords and the Black Liberation Army and all of that being said. I mean, growing up in the Bronx, you know, I grew up, I grew up in the Bronx in the 70s, so, you know, I'm a hip-hop baby. And um, for a long time, I believe that my generation, those of us born after 1969, the hip hop generation as coined by Bakari Katawana, were going to use hip hop to move us towards liberation. And again, I was naive and not understanding that the rap industrial complex has really much destroyed hip hop culture and co-opted it and corporatized it and branded and marketed it. Um, as well as, you know, it's funny you bring up that because yesterday with all this stuff with Kanye West going on in a Chance the Rapper 
and I had tweeted Chance the Rapper, and I was like, listen, like, nobody's upset. Like, really, like, hip-hop been let go of Kanye. He's been in that sunken place for a minute. There's a lot of reasons why, and some of us understand that the death is mother, and there's a lot of pain there. With that said, what I tweeted Chance the Rapper, which then went viral, I didn't even know till this morning, and mad people were hitting me up, was like, we're not, because then Chance's response was, we're not all Democrats. And I said, nobody's talking about political parties. We're talking about this dude siding with a white supremacist, okay? You're, you're putting on a hat. Then you're with Lyle Cohen, who anybody in hip hop that had, has a political radical voice, that man has tried to destroy. So I just found this like whole thing fascinating to bring hip hop, and I said, listen, if hip hop continues to be hyper masculine, hyper homophobic, hyper transphobic, hyper capitalist, then young people will have to create something new. And a lot of my homies in hip hop were like, how can you say it? Because it's true. Sometimes things don't work anymore. Sometimes language becomes not only stagnated, that the system co-ops it. It's not actually the fault of those of us who created it. I don't think you can safeguard everything. I don't think you can safeguard culture, culture. But what we can do is say, this speaks for me and that doesn't. So when you call me Hispanic, this is from the welfare poet, poets, when you call me Hispanic, all my purity seems to vanish. That is not who I be. And I realized that the most that it really impacted me was my daughter was born on January 1st, 2005. I've been really, really, really sick with her. Like, I could have died during my pregnancy. The doctors were like, if you continue with this pregnancy, you know, I lost like 50 pounds. My hair was falling out. It was, I had a crazy disease. But she was actually born with no complications. I had natural birth right there at Methodist right here in Brooklyn. And the next day, they brought in the birth certificate. And I remember um, my husband was there, my, my comrade, Lumuba Bandelli, from the Malcolm X grassroots movement was there. And they were like, they had already checked off Hispanic. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna need a new one. <laughs> and Lumumba was like, really, dude, you just had a child. And I'm like, why are you questioning me? You're my comrade. And my husband's like, not today. Like, let's just get out of here. Like, the baby's born, everybody's happy. Like, and I said, no, this is how it starts. It starts with whoever was at that desk already identifying my daughter. What a disservice I would be doing in not racially socializing from the beginning to know you're a black Puerto Rican. In many ways, that is a wonderful, beautiful thing. And in other ways, the state sees you as a target. So from the minute you're born, I was so adamant they brought it back. They were like, we can't change it. I said, I'm not leaving until I get a new birth certificate. They sent in a social worker to then be like, are you having mental health issues? Should we run a drug screen? No, it was crazy. And I was just like, yeah, I'm not leaving. Um, I, and they said, there's not a category. And I said, then I'm going to make one. And her birth certificate says, others is black Puerto Rican. You know what I'm saying? And that is not because I think I'm exceptional to this. That is because I've been raised in the movement. And I don't mean, and I think this is super important for younger folks to know that are just beginning. I was not born in a movement household. Okay, I grew up in the Bronx, and then I grew up in the poorest congressional district, and then 18 miles away, when I was nine, my dad hit a number, right? Old school hit the number from the bodega and bought a house in Westchester County. I lived an experience where for five days a week, I lived in the richest suburb, the second richest suburb in the United States, Westchester County, 18 miles away where every weekend I would come and see my cousins and my community living in poverty. And even growing up like that, it wasn't until I went to college. And I, I found who I was because of the Black Student Union, Black students, Latino students, professors, Black women, then being exposed to all my, my elders and, and finding out about the Young Lords and the Black Panther Party. I hadn't even read Malcolm X. 
You see what I'm saying? So I didn't grow up in any type of movement household. I grew up in a very proud Puerto Rican household, proud that I knew the parade was important, but I didn't know who Pedro Albizu Campos was. I knew that our flag was important, but I didn't know that the flag was outlawed. I didn't now, then I began to realize too, oh, my abuela was one of those women that went under law 116, you know, that sterilized one third of the women in Puerto Rico. And I never knew why she was so angry about everything until she almost died and told me the story. So all that to say is that when well, identity is important, but how you come into this work, everybody comes in when they come in. And a lot of times in this work, you think that people are born into it, and most of us are not born into it. There's something that happens, an identity shift, a, a, a experience, something wakes you up and you're like, wait, my whole world has changed. And sometimes in that changing, you also lose family. You don't lose them like in death, but you're like, everything you're about, I'm no longer about. So my identity is always, I guess my, my thing that I always look at, like as long as I have this, no one can take that away from me. And I pass that down to my daughter, and now I see my daughter has broken whatever me and my husband didn't have. We didn't grow up in movement, and now she has. She'll carry that on. So that's how I look at, at these kind of, kind of things, and that's what I'm doing my PhD in. And when I talk to, lastly, about Afro-Latino identity, it's super trendy right now. You know, I'm amazed because you're right, years ago, for some of us to say we're African descendant, or don't call me Hispanic, or wait, do you know about slavery in Puerto Rico? People would look at you like you were crazy or you'd just be regulated to like the one panel on black people or Africa, and now it's trendy. But what I caution a lot of Latino, Latina, Latinx folks that are finding this identity is first, you have to not only deal with white supremacy, you have to deal with anti-blackness. Those are two different things. Then you have to deal with colorism. That plays out more in Latin American descendant communities um, or people from what is known as Latin America. But just because something is trendy doesn't mean there's a politic to it. And most of what we're seeing now around Afro-Latina, Latina, Latinx identity has to do with skin color, hair, dancing, and food. But where are the politics of blackness? What does it mean? right, to discuss, let's say, Cardi B, who would never identify as afro Latin. She's like, I'm just Dominican from the Bronx, which is fine. She's not denying who she is. And Trin yeah, she's not denying who she is, but she doesn't have right yet the political education that will make it move. Same with Amara La Negra. Amazing to see someone like that visually represented finally in, in, in media. Right, but where's her politics? Her politics are super capitalistic. Anything she tweets about is her wanting to be cast by Steven Spielberg. So you're like, why? That gets back to what Edis was saying about needing to learn history. Of yeah, and that's, that, that's, of that's what it all are, comes right? down to. Identity yeah. comes down to history. You know, you always have to look back at the past. That is the requiem for how we move forward. But in this moment where young people who are, can now not just have to say I'm, I'm Latina and what that means and it doesn't really include race. So you also have to be careful of these terms that then like get literally whitewashed, watered down or co-opted. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right, y'all, so who, who has some questions? It's nine o'clock, wow. Uh, like, I was like, we have two hours, Edie. So she was like, that's what you think. <laughs> well, I think, I don't know, I don't see anybody kicking us out. Maybe we can take a couple questions too. Yeah, over here, yeah. Oh, there's a mics right there. So my question is for mainly Victoria, but you guys can all answer. Okay, so near my house, there's like this empty clearing, right? And it's a very dirty lot. 
And there's like a whole bed frame in the actual lot. That's how dirty it is. But I recently I've heard that um, poor folk like clean streets too, right? Which is definitely the truth. But in my neighborhood, with my neighborhood getting clean, I'm very scared that some people might realize just how beautiful it is when it's clean and might try to come in and take over that. So I'm like conflicted that if I clean it up, then people might come in and try to take up what I did, so. That's a very real fear, especially in how real estate development is looking in a lot of New York right now. Um, I would say initially what comes to my mind is clean it up and make it yours. So I don't know, I think about um, the art that we were talking about. This is a very specific idea. I don't know the plausibility of it being executed, <laughs> but um, you know, just cleaning it up, but maybe you have a lot of artists in your community, you wanna make that lot clear that this is our lot. I don't know what neighborhood you live in, but you know, just make it like this is ours, put some art in there, you know, really show that you own it. You didn't just clean it, but you own it. And you know, put a big, uh, big sign outside that says clean, <laughs> sorry. Put a big sign outside that says cleaned by the people of this neighborhood and not any of you wanderers who stumble in here. And just, you know, really own it is what I would say, because they're really willing to take it away. This, this reminds me of a conversation that I always have with, with um, my daughter who's um, 12. She's not here, so no. Okay, I wanna talk about her for a minute. Um, and she was born you know, in, our, in our house here in Crown Heights on Kingston Avenue. And you know, she went to a, middle, to a public middle school in another district um, that is in a very different neighborhood from ours. And we have this ongoing struggle with her at times coming up to myself and her dad and saying things like, you know, I wish we lived in such and such a neighborhood because it's so clean and beautiful there. Why can't it be like that on our, on our street, on our Ave, you know? And, and of course, like all the questions that her, myself and her dad was like, what do you mean by that? Why are you saying that? Nah, 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 nah. But really on a very fundamental level, it's like, why is it that it's that, that, um, that you know, I, I recognize that she wants to be in a beautiful place, right? She wants to be in a place that's clean, that's not full of trash, but hasn't yet had the, the opportunity to understand a systemic analysis that would help her to answer the question, why is it that nobody is picking up the trash with the same kind of frequency in this neighborhood as they are in Carroll Gardens, you know? And so I think part of the, the question is also, you know, going back, for example, to the examples of, of, of the Young Lords and the Black Panthers, where is the environmental organizing that's doing organizing, and I mean, I'm, I'm putting myself in that, not to say that someone else has to do that, but around basic things that impact people in very basic ways, like trash, right? Like why, like where is, where is the organizing movement around trash pickup, and where's the equity in that? It's so basic, you know? We probably have time for one other. Yeah. Quick, um, my name is Naima. I'm currently pursuing my BA in Global Studies at the New School. And for one of my final projects this semester, I'm focusing on uh, the resistance efforts of Afro-Brazilian women as they exist um, in direct conflict with or resistance to gender and race-based oppression. Um, and you know, through my research, I found that often these movements of resistance result in liberation for these, for these women. And so my question to the entire panel would be, can you think of any specific moment within your activism um, that you felt especially liberated or is there anything about your activism that liberates you on a daily basis or what does liberation mean to you? I guess maybe that's not just one question, but a few, but is it? Like clear? Does it make sense? Okay. I mean, look, I've, I, I think I've had a lot. I mean, I think we probably all have a lot. I, I would point to two specific moments which are very opposite. One was um, 
being arrested at the United Nations for actions around uh, the struggle to get the U.S. Navy out of Vieques, Puerto Rico, because it was one of those times in particularly Puerto Rican organizing, but New York organizing, that we all had one goal, and we kind of never deviated from that, which is to make sure that the U.S. Navy left Puerto Rico, and they did on May 1st of 2003. So I was involved as part of the David Sanis Rodriguez Brigade here in New York, but there were other iterations of work around Vieques, um, 100 Women for Vieques and other things that I know Edie's was also involved in, right? So, um, but the reason that, that sticks out is because on May 1st, 2003, I was in Vieques when this happened and I documented it. Right? And to see the U.S. Navy leave and the exhilaration and then literally see Lolita LeBron and catch her and, and interview her was like, because for then I, I also realized in 2003 how important our stories are to tell um, and how we tell our narrative. And that's when I kind of became an independent journalist and I joined WBAI radio and I began to do a show on WBAI, and I understood really media, and actually, um, Edie's has also been a person that I look to, because like I said, she made this documentary in 1996, where everybody was telling her, nobody wants to hear that story, um, and her work in media. And then the second one, which is always the reminder how much the state hates us, is my Ferguson, when I went to Ferguson, I was finishing up my coursework at UMass Amherst for my PhD and getting ready to take a visiting professorship at Cal State LA, and that was the week that Ferguson rebelled. And I remember watching it, I'm packing, and with, I'm talking to people, and Black Lives Matter starts trending, even though it had started the year before, and I kept saying, I'm in my house talking to myself, my husband, my daughter, like, this is something new, these young people, and I saw the militarization of the response, and um, this hip hop artist, Talib Kweli, called me, and he's like, yo, we need to get down there. And I'm like, we need to go there immediately. This is something different, and we can't just be on the sidelines. And we got there the next day, and by 9.30 p.m. that night, me and 14 other people had M16s to our heads, where the police were like, if you move, we will kill you. And I remember being there with my hands up and this young brother was lying down and he just, you know, just on some human, you're like trying to get up from the situation and I had to hold him down and I'm like, don't move. And the cop came closer to us and was like, tell him to stop moving or I'm gonna shoot him. He put the M16 right to this kid's chest. And when we left that night, I wrote this story and Again, I don't think that experience is actually an exceptional experience. I know too many people that have had that experience when protesting, but these diametric experiences of like seeing victory happen and claiming victory, and then 13 years later feeling like I, I was gonna die with my comrades for what, supporting and doing what we're supposed to be doing and fighting back. So I look at those experiences as like, I hold them dear in that way, you know? Well, I'll give you a, a different type of uh, feeling of victory and, and liberation, um, more of an internal one that happens when you're organizing women in particular. And uh, when we, when, when I entered the Young Lords, um, the organization was very, very, very sexist because the society was very sexist. And so one of the um, uh, leaders of the Young Lords writes later, the, uh, from uh, one of the male leaders writes later that when women first, women in the organization first raised the issue of women's lib that the men felt that all they needed was a good, you know, and that's what he wrote. So what, that was the environment that we were organizing in. And um, 
So we began to challenge that uh, environment and, and those ideas uh, by organizing ourselves into a women's caucus. And so we won many things. We were actually quite victorious, uh, which doesn't get written in the, in the history books and is still a bone of contention with some of the male members 50 years later who call it revisionist history, right? Uh, when, when we tell our own story. But I'll tell you what we won that was very significant. One, we got that revolutionary machismo out of the program. That was very important. I'll tell you a bunch of things uh, before I get to the main thing that I wanna talk about. We got women's stories written about in the organization's newspaper. And we got women to be assigned stories as writers on any topic. Uh, we got the histories and struggles of women to be included in the political education curriculum that we provided both for the community and for the membership. Uh, one of the most interesting that, that we formed a, a men's caucus so that men could talk among themselves about the relationship between sexism and capitalism, basically, but also so they could talk about their experiences, how they felt about women, et cetera. They had a, a, a space, and this was something that men never did. Men never talked about their feelings, especially to other men. Um, but one of the most significant things that happened, I think it may have been the only time it happened in the Puerto Rican movement of that era, was that we developed, we wanted there to be consequences for sexist actions and sexist behavior. And we were able to get consensus for that. And so that meant that, uh, and I raise that because of the B2 movement and because people are coming out that, you know, men that, that, that commit sexist acts or, uh, or, or abuse women should be fired from their jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So it became, came up like, wow, this is a new idea. 50 years ago, 20 year old, 22 year old women were dealing with this issue. And we got consensus that there should be consequences for this type of behavior, especially in a revolutionary organization. So how did that play out? All of the leaders, except one, were demoted or suspended for machismo or sexism over a two year period. All of them, except one, and he was 15. And so that was very, that created a ripple effect in the entire movement because, and we felt very liberated because we had been able to uh, accomplish um, something very significant for, for Latina women at that time. And um, that moved the organization forward to adopt Instead of revolutionary machismo, we said the revolution within the revolution. So we are now officially out of time, but Victoria, I did want, if you have something brief, no? You're, you're feel fulfilled with some of the, some of the examples given? Um, I wanna really thank each and every one of you for the honor of participating in this conversation with me. It's been um, really incredibly inspiring. And I want to thank you all for showing up and being a part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.